All right, so thanks very much everyone for coming um, to the March uh, No Code Northeast. Um, we've done pretty well, given that we only released it about, what was it, less than 10 days ago. So um, we had uh, uh, well over 30 registrations. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone who's made it. Uh, hello to anyone who's new and welcome back to, to the people who have uh, joined us again. Mm. Um, in usual fashion, especially for the new people, and also because we have finalised finally a uh, some dates and a and a time and a venue, I'm just going to quickly do an intro into um, uh, No Code Arcade if I can. So just to to let everyone know that we're we've got an event, a conference um, for No Code happening in the northeast on the 14th and 15th of June, which is a, a Wednesday and a Thursday. Um, at Northumbria Uni in Newcastle at the Business and Law Centre. Um, <clears throat> so very excited about that. It's a new community conference for no-code, low-code developers and makers, um, also for platforms as well. Um, but uh, yeah, a um, little quote there in terms of uh, not needing to become a programme to build things on the internet. I'm sure anyone who's here knows about no-code uh, and low-code, but, um, but yeah. Um, we're very much uh, looking forward to having a new wave of makers from different backgrounds and perspectives. Um, the event is organised by Sunderland Software City, as is uh, No Code Northeast, um, in partnership with Dynamo, um, who are organising a festival at the same time, which I'll talk about in a second, and the Catapult, uh, um, the Digital Catapult Northeast Tees Valley. Um, the reason that we're putting on a conference is um, primarily that uh, we want to raise the profile of no code like this group uh, in the region and, and hopefully develop it into a bit of a hotspot. Um, uh, I think we need to, we need, there's some catch up to do with some areas down south, I think, but also, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it'd be nice to feel like people are coming from around uh, the Northeast into the Northeast specifically for uh, no code uh, arcade. Um, We've also got the potential, we hope, to, to turn it into a bit of a flagship event. So this is a, a, a pilot. We're starting off relatively small, um, but we have got ideas and plans for, for a much bigger event uh, down the line if it works out well. Um, and also we, we feel that it's a, a, a part of, as we've talked about quite a lot in these sessions, part of addressing the skills gap in IT by uh, providing new opportunities for software development. So the event's going to be part of Tech Next, which uh, you, some of you may have heard of. Um, it's a festival for the Northeast. Um, there's going to be events happening across the 19th to the 23rd of June across the Northeast. Um, so there's going to be stuff in all in all local authority areas um, uh, uh, in the Northeast. There's five, I think, main events and then a bunch of uh, fringe events that will be happening. And, and people could sign up now if they're interested in doing an event, a fringe event. Um, you can you can propose it now on the Technex website, which you've got the, the web address there, technex.co.uk. Um, and no code will be happening on the Wednesday and Thursday, and then we've got the party on the Thursday night, so it's uh, it's good timing. Program, roughly speaking, the first day will be made up of workshops, so we're calling that the Platform Arcade, where people will be able to try out different platforms. Um, there'll be workshops that will be deep dives into one platform, some that will be looking at a few platforms, uh, anything from half a day to a full day of, of, of workshop. Most of those workshops will be free and it'll be on a first come first serve basis. Uh, we'll be launching the workshops a little bit afterwards. They're not finalized yet, um, but we'll be contacting anyone who's got a ticket um, uh, to, to sign up to those. So you get your ticket sooner, then you'll get more chance of getting the workshop that you want. Then day two is about the NOCO conference. So we'll have uh, 16 speakers coming uh, to talk about um, uh, no code, uh, where it's at, uh, industry leaders. Um, and we expect those uh, people to be coming from across the, the UK, possibly even abroad, but we have yet to uh, finalise that. And then uh, we'll also have a developer arcade, so we'll have a space there uh, where they'll be able, anyone who's built a platform using no code will be able, to be able to do a bit of a lightning pitch for what they've been doing. Um, and hopefully we'll get a few sessions like that so that people within breaks and different times in the day will be able to also find out about some of the tools and, and things that people have built. Um, so that's the developer arcade as well. We're hoping also to run some challenges during the days uh, that people can get involved in in terms of using no code to uh, to to support different uh, uh, to address different challenges. 
so that's that i will leave it there um for now and uh, if you want any more information drop me an email we are looking for sponsors we are going to be putting out a call for speakers so if you're interested in any of those things uh, and then buying tickets they should be available at the very latest by monday next week but but i'm hoping to get it online um this week if you're not already please follow us on twitter uh at noconortheast.com uh, or um join uh, uh join us on the website and it'll be going out via email that's just a, a mailchimp the sign up's just a mailchimp sign up um so at noconortheast.com okie dokie i am going to leave it there and uh just do a quick introduction to John Layton, who is Chief Exec at Land Digital. Um, and he is going to tell you, uh, do you need to share, share your screen, John? Give this a go. So John's going to tell you about all of the, uh, well, not all, I'm sure that would take far too long, but uh, uh, some of the uh, the fun and the challenges and, and the and the positive stuff about as a um, as a um, uh, agency how it's been to to use no code with some of his clients and thanks John for for doing this and I'll hand it over to you. Right, let me just work this out. Looks good. Can you see the? Oh, we've got the uh, the banner, but yeah, that's what I say about Google. Is it a Google presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two seconds, right? So you can see the no code, no problem title screen. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Yes. Yeah, so just to give you an idea. This is all of this is all based on our experiences. It's very agency led, um, but there are some a couple of internal projects that I'll go through, uh, and just some just general experiences really over the last twelve to eighteen months. So who are we? So yeah, we run a company called Land Digital, uh, based in Sunderland. We're a digital development agency. So we focus on user experience, software development, and probably more recently, data visualization. Work with a wide range of businesses, uh, clients from like local tech startups to you know global brands, the work, the work bearers. And then for us, no code really demonstrates potential on how we can improve our processes, both as a business, but also uh, as part of our service delivery to clients. So no code isn't new, and I recognize some of the faces uh, uh, that have turned up tonight, and you, you'll validate that for me. No code has been around for a while, and low code has been around for you know, 10, 15 years. And when I say low code, I mean things like WordPress, you know, Drupal, and what have you. Even Shopify is a mixture between no code and, and low code. And I would guess that we've all had exposure to some of these platforms at you know, one time or another. But I do think probably over the last two or three years, there's a strong argument that no code, no code has like moved, moved past its like early adopter stage and it's now in a mature market. The platforms available provide us with a lot more opportunity and flexibility. Um, and there's a lot of them. You know, there's more and more, you know, launching, launching every day. The ones on the right, so Shopify, Webflow, Typeform, Adalo, these are probably the platforms that we've had the most exposure to. Um, one thing I was playing around today, actually, just as a quick side note, if anyone's looking to implement ChatGPT in like a no code, uh, I mean, there's probably a few, but Lambot have just released this kind of ChatGPT3 integration. It's not... There's a little bit of code involved, but the steps that they actually give you are, are pretty clear. And that's how you can take your chatbot or any kind of lead generation chatbot to, to you know, it's what I consider the next level. And that's what we're kind of playing with at the minute. Um, but if you look at the left, I mean, I've just taken that screenshot from a, a Google search. It's probably not that comprehensive. It's probably two or three times the size of that. Um, because when I looked at that, I could always see that there was a few that were, that were missing. But that just goes to show you just you know how big I guess it's getting and it's getting it's getting more and more popular every day. So for no code for us. So if we go through, I guess what I would consider like almost a standard uh software delivery um process, you know, it starts with like user requirements, gathering the user requirements, actually determine what you know what what the business or what you know what the what the product or the project needs to do. And then we go to kind of wireframes and, and, and design. So that's that's great. 
um, you know, and, and we still do that. But with no code, what we can actually do is we can prototype and we can actually almost build something that takes it past Figma and XD and all the other kind of wireframe tools. And what that actually means is we can minimize the time just to validate that product. And that's kind of what it's, it, that's what we kind of see is quite big for us is like the validation. So it's about failing fast, I think, and then learning and, and obtaining that kind of data and feedback in days and weeks rather than months, you know, if not years. To give you an example, I was on a call this afternoon, and this is a enterprise client, but like a little mini startup product incubator. And to validate their pricing packages, they they believe they will get there by December. You know, so that's nine months worth of pricing validation for a product that really is still in its early stages. You really shouldn't take that long. And I think, you know, with no code, that gives us the ability to get there a whole lot quicker and like to minimize initial outlay. And when I say initial outlay, I don't always mean cost. I mean time. You know, you imagine, you know, time is arguably just as valuable, if, if not more, cause, you know, cause it's, it's finite. And getting feedback as quickly as possible. So I guess any kind of experiment or where there are levels of uncertainty, you kind of want to minimize risk. So rather than uh, committing to some kind of custom software project, you know, you now have the ability to either, you know, once you've got your prototypes, just to see how quickly you can build something. It doesn't really have to look that good. It's just to get that that feel of what how it interacts when you've got it in, you know, in, in front of you. Um, and then no code allows us to focus on features rather than duplication. So what I mean by that is, you know, there's lots of packages and there's lots of things out there. But if you want to do like a social login, if you want to do Google authentication, you know, even with a package, you're probably looking at four to six hours with a no code solution. You know, you're looking at 30 minutes to 60 minutes. If you've got your credentials there, it's a great way of adding features very, very quickly just to test and, and you know, how useful and, and how impactful they're going to be. Uh, a good example of that. So every project that we start, the first user story is as a user, uh, I must be able to reset my password. That doesn't happen with no code. It's just automatically there and we just have to link it up. Um, but there is an element of recreating the wheel with a software project that I think no code eliminates. And I think that there demonstrates that demonstrates value. Um, and the setup, your deployment environment and your infrastructure, which is pretty much what gives us the headaches on a regular basis, is 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 ninety nine percent taken care of you, taken care of you. And I think that again is a, is a, is a huge advantage. So I think for us, it's the ability to iterate rapidly and then, I guess, yeah, validate your idea quickly. Uh, I'll go through some of the examples of where we've been to make those changes a little bit later on, um, which actually would have been tricky had it been a custom software project. So no code has put a great deal of power in the hands of anybody. However, I think that power needs to be hand, handled with a level of responsibility. And, and again, if I look at this from an agency point of view, you need to be very, very clear on what you're actually selling to your client and that the no-code platform that you are using actually can do it. Um, no deployment or infrastructure, which is brilliant. A drag and drop visual editor, you know, brilliant. It means you can start literally dragging elements onto a screen and knowing that they'll work when you see them through whatever, whatever delivery channel, if it's a browser, if it's a mobile app. Um, Based on my experience, they all have limitations and I haven't or we haven't always found out about those limitations until the end. In fact, I can give you one example where we built a piece of middleware uh, and it was for a back office function. And it wasn't until the end that we found out the authentication process because of the many different rules they had on their internal network just didn't work and we had to rebuild it. Now, that's probably, you know, an isolated incident. But it just gives you an idea of, if we go back to the previous slide, is just to fail as quickly as you possible, find out, you know, can it achieve everything you want it to before actually committing to the entire build? Because there is still time in there. And managing invest, uh, managing expectations for the client. So I've like heard some pitches where no code is like the ultimate solution to everything. Uh, based on my experience, there is no ultimate solution to everything, or certainly I haven't found it yet. And I think managing expectations for clients is just makes life easier for yourself. Do some homework on the platform. Um, what kind of reviews are out there? Any kind of forums, Twitter, Reddit. Uh, in fact, if it has a forum, that's the first place that we will look, uh, particularly if we're looking to scope out any particular project where we think no code is suitable.
if you just look at the website of a no code platform, a lot of them, and we all do this, you know, over promise and under deliver, they are looking to attract as many customers as possible. And again, they are looking to do exactly what you're trying to do, obtain your feedback, find out exactly what you need and then develop it. You just need to be aware of what those limitations are. And then a few of them. So probably the one that I think requires the most upfront learning at the minute is Bubble. In fact, Bubble is, you could argue it's a language of its, its sort. Of, the learning curve is quite steep. It's probably the most flexible and versatile, uh, but I don't think it's one that you can just pick up over a weekend and build something <clears throat> uh, unless you just, you know, unless you are just one of those people that, that, can, that can pick it up. So because it's almost like a no-code rush, I guess, if you like, so going back maybe four or five years ago, there was a JavaScript library being, being released every day, if not every, you know, every week, if not every day. And the challenge you had there is to know if you implemented that JavaScript library, would it still be around and supported in two or three months time or, you know, 12, 24 months time, depending on the life cycle of your product. And this is the same for no code, except you are, I guess, arguably truly vendor locked. So if we look at any kind of platform, we've got a list of questions that we kind of go through. They don't have to hit all of these questions, but I think it's just a good idea or just a, a high level of due diligence. How long has it been around for? Have they just launched? You know, is there a little bit of maturity in the market? Have they been around for two or three years? Has it had any funding? You can find that out on Crunchbase, just to give you an idea of any kind of stability, uh, financial stability. What the reviews look like? Has it been on Product Hunt, Captera? I think it's G2 is the other one. What does their support look like? You can normally find that out on any kind of social platform to find out if they're responsive. Are they flexible? Will they, will they help you? Uh, and then this is a nice to have. Is there a code export available? Now I'm starting to see that a little bit more and I'm actually starting to see um, a lot more hosted, no tool um, platforms, which is quite nice. So you don't necessarily have access to the code, but you're not reliant on someone else's infrastructure if you do want that level of control. Um, so I think those are just some of the points that we look at, and then we'll go through, I guess, like some internal, internal testing for maybe a week or so, depending on what the project entails. And I guess what our level of uncertainty is that that no code platform can actually, you know, meet, if not or meet or at minimum or exceed the expectations of that project. So how we have used, used no code or some of the no code projects that we've worked on in the last 12 months. So screenshot on the left, this is a very high level OKR tracking app. So OKRs, if you haven't come across them, uh, objectives and key results, it is a method of setting objectives for yourself, either personally or professionally. And then you have key results, which uh, identify how you're actually gonna measure those, those objectives. Loads of OKR platforms out there, absolutely loads. This one, the problem with some of the OKR platforms out there, they're, they're actually really quite complicated if you're only looking to use some of the features. So this was built uh, for, I can't remember which council it was actually. It was built for a third party that was gonna use it as a council that want to measure and then target themselves on uh, carbon emissions uh, on uh, for their employees. Uh, traveling to and from work so the idea is depending on where you live you can set objectives on how you actually can reduce those whether it's using public transport whether it's car sharing and then you can actually measure them on the key results though that data will then feed up to the organization and they then can report on it to their stakeholders or uh, their annual the annual shareholders meeting so i don't think it was a council quite lightweight this wasn't particularly difficult to actually build because there are a lot of okr um applications out there so we were able just to do some research on the existing ones and basically we were just stripping out features you're probably looking at you're looking at weeks to build that rather than months i think if it was if, if it was a true software project you'd probably be looking at a couple of months so that gives you an idea of i guess what you can do and the fact that it's only really designed for an 18 month project that hits the life cycle of you know of of, of what they actually need it for uh then the other one uh, property management app. So this is for a US company, um, which throw a few curveballs, which I'll catch you about later on. So the US property market works slightly different in the fact that it's very um, scattered. 
and there's a lot of independents who all have their own little um I suppose their own uh, their own portfolios and there's no real way of aggregating them so what they were looking for was uh, a database that would aggregate this data it would then store other kind of financial metrics in line with uh, properties that they did manage to identify if an upcoming property was viable or not and if they would get the rate of return so effectively it literally a database that just captures it with a nice ui um so people out and about can update it as and when they go uh, so that's currently going through a testing phase at the minute. Uh, the only thing that that fell short on, and this is, I guess, one thing as well for testing requirements. So the one thing that they really, really wanted was offline access. So the ability to load all of that data offline, that is tricky to do uh, in no code. It's probably that's where you start moving towards a native mobile app. So we presented like the two options and it turns out offline access wasn't that important anymore. <laughs> And they went with the no. They went with the no code option, uh, which is often the case. Everyone wants offline access, but it deals with maybe point, you know, maybe one percent of all use cases, if that. And it's it normally comes down to being nice to have. Okay, so <clears throat> this is an interesting one, and this takes us past no code a little bit, and more about the like the culture of the organization. So. This is a pet uh, pet company. So what they do is like pack walks, boarding, a lot of training, hydrotherapy. They've got their own pool. They've got a field, sand pit. So they, it is almost like the luxury spa for pets. Given that pet uh, ownership and adoption has gone through the roof over the last three to four years, their business has scaled alongside it. Up until maybe 12 months ago, they were a purely manual um business and when I say manual that's writing the tasks onto a piece of paper then handing them out to the various different people to action throughout the day so when I go back to culture and um, like digital this was a big change for them a huge change actually so they had some really quite complex rules which in real life or taken offline weren't particularly that difficult to implement but when you try and digitize or codify them that, that became challenging I would say that if they went through a custom software project, not going through any kind of digital project before, it probably would have come prohibitively expensive. And I'm not sure it would have made it uh, simply because they were, I'm going to say they were changing the, their mind all the time, but once they started to understand a little bit more about the process, then the feedback got more and more comprehensive. And there were times that we had to kind of change the direction we were going in. Now, fortunately, that was actually quite easy to do uh, for this platform. For, uh, this was a Dallo. Um, that was quite easy to do because we were using that kind of visual drag and drop editor rather than kind of refactoring code or then even worse, using code for purposes that was never meant. It was never meant to be used for. So this is a progressive web application. Uh, it's hosted on their website, then downloads an icon to the to the uh, to the uh, user's device. It allows them to take bookings via the app so what you do is when you sign up you create a pet profile if you have multiple pets you have multiple profiles and those profiles document things like risk assessments training records anything to be aware of about that particular pet predominantly dogs uh, and it also allows you to take bookings and make payments prior to this you could make a booking over any channel of comms and i mean any channel you could email them you could text them you could whatsapp them message at them you could call them these bookings were then manually inputted into a diary, which would then be written out on a piece of paper and handed out to everyone on a daily basis. They reckon the manual processes were taking them up to five hours per day. That's now being reduced to one. So that's a win for them. And now they have a lot. So I think it went live about maybe nine months ago. They have a lot more confidence now in understanding exactly how things work, like the kind of process when you're specking out a project and actually what you need and against what you want. So they're now moving into like phase two and, and, and phase and phase three. This, I think, is a really good example of like how no code can be introduced to smaller businesses that would uh, historically, you know, almost run a mile from anyone that started talking about custom software projects and you know, you know, sprints, iterations, and you know, I think you know we'll have something, we'll have an MVP in like three or four months. Um, this was actually a lot quicker uh, and. I think it's uh I think they're on about 8,000 bookings or so. So it's definitely having an impact on their business, which is which is good. So that was a win. So that one was quite good. I think the only challenge with this one is um with some of their discount rules, they had to kind of strip back 
their discount rules because they almost had discounts on a per customer basis and you know even with, even with like existing mature uh platforms that's really really difficult so by the time they were basically it took the, the time probably took more to actually codify their offline practices and to digitize them rather than actually build the app itself so that was a win this is an internal project that uh, we've been working on. So we got asked to look at um, a no-code native application. So when I say native, I mean, it can be distributed through you know, iOS App Store and, and Google Play. We hadn't used no-code to do that before. So I'd had this idea um, knocking around about having uh, an app that could just track which hills, you know, a few of our friends could track which hills we've done and have like a little table. Uh, basically it's almost a to-do list with pictures. You know, if you want to, if you want to strip it down to its functionality, I put the QR code on there. And if anyone wants to download it, uh, feel free. It's on Android and iOS. The only thing I ask you to do is don't leave a review and I'll explain why now. From a database structure, this is really simple. Uh, user table, uh, peak table, and then there's another table just to say exactly when you've, you know, when you've actually bagged that peak. The main problem with this so it's actually a little bit more complicated. We stripped this down to the bare bones. You also have the ability to create custom challenges. And what that custom challenge meant was you just say, you know, John's June challenge, and I could put various peaks in there and I could share that with uh, some of my friends. And then we could all see who would achieve it first. That had to get stripped back. It is horrendously slow. In fact, the joke in the office is we could probably walk half those peaks by the time you signed up and actually determined which one you want to do and then saved it to your wish list. And I mean slow which is why I ask you not to leave a review, right? because I know. <laughs> so the good thing or the positive thing is once you get past the speed, so I handed out to a few of my friends, they said they wouldn't use it, it was painfully slow. Um, but okay, so that, that, yeah, that's good feedback in itself. But I think where the really powerful feedback is, so when we first had this idea, uh, wrote out a you know, very, very high level scope and, and asked it to be quote out internally using you know something like Firebase or React Native, That was about I don't know, four or five months ago, sat on that quote, built it, handed it out there. We know it's slow, but the quote to move it to a custom platform now is considerably lower than the quotes I had about four or five months ago. Now we all learn as we go, but I think there is value in having something that's past prototype or wireframe that you can move around, click, and just get a general feel of how it works. And that gives so much context to the developer before they're about to build, I think is incredibly powerful. This app, I'm giving it's probably about four or five weeks to build, and that includes messing around with some database switching. As an example, we wanted to use Airtable for the database. We found out that had some serious restrictions when it came to images and also the user table. So we had to switch that back to a Um The John, John so, sorry to interrupt, John. Uh, just the question: what what was that built with? Uh, the app, a Dalo. A Dalo. So so it's a Dalo that's slow for native apps. Is that? I wasn't going to, you know, point names, but I mean, <laughs> so it's again, this is one where, you know, you fail quickly. So we've done that. We've chosen this as an, an internal project. So I take the risk, right? Or we take the risk rather. I have my headphones. So I missed that. Oh, no, I haven't got the chat function in front of me. Sorry. Was there a question there? No, I think it was a uh, accidental jump. Uh, cool, cool. So, you know, if you do get a chance to download it and then put yourself in the client's position, tell me what your feedback would be. Um, but yeah, so going back to the custom software project, I reckon it's about 50%. And also if anyone's dealt with any kind of software project, this is at the beginning, right? It's 50% lower. You know, if you want to ask me what it looks like in three months time, <laughs> the answer might not be the same. Um, yeah. Then we had another request come in where they wanted a native app serving content from WordPress, which I thought that was a no brainer and dead easy. I couldn't find anything to do it. Nothing. So, you know, if anyone's looking for an opportunity there, there there's something because that should be relatively simple. All you're looking for is a no code, no code UI that's just consuming the WordPress uh, um, WordPress content via the API. That shouldn't be that difficult. Yet we couldn't find a suitable way or a way that we were comfortable with 
that actually had any benefits over just custom, you know, over a, cu a custom solution, which is actually what we ended up going down to uh, down, going with in the end, because uh, we just weren't happy with that. And I would have thought that something like that would have existed because there would be a market there. What was really there, it was just um, vanilla templates, basically, that you just sat on top of your WordPress website. It didn't really give you much custom your customization ability at all. Where I do really see the benefit, and I think this is where we um, we have used it probably the most within our company, but um, I can't really go through examples because um, I'm really giving away, you know, potentially clients' uh, internal processes, but I can give you examples of some of the ones that we looked at. So we had a client uh, a while ago that wanted basically automat uh, automated emails, uh, automated e-sign-in. So they would create a form on the – create a uh, Put their details into a form on the website that would then go into the pipe drive crm if the details were correct it would get moved to another stage that would then trigger via zapier go into hello sign populate all the data uh this form needed two signatures on it and it had probably around about 18 data fields once that had been populated signed it would then go to an automated printer it would then print out a copy and then that would get sent to the individual's address for the, for their records in addition to the e-signing one, there was some reason why they had to have a physical copy as well. Zapier has been around for ages. In fact, if anyone uses Zapier, their pricing plan is about to um, significantly increase at the end of this month. But there are now quite a lot of alternatives. Um, and I guess depending on exactly what you want the middleware for or you know how many interactions or zaps they're going to be, it's always worth you know just shopping around a little bit more. Zapier is not the only option there is. Any, uh, it's, yeah, it's not the only option. Then the one on the right. So we've kind of got a sub brand. We're not really doing a huge amount with it in the minute. So it's called No Code Labs. The idea behind that is it's a client portal. So rather than rather than quoting on time, it's our effort or our interpretation of story pointing. So story pointing for anyone that's not familiar is based on effort, I guess, and complexity rather than how long it would take. So what you can do is you can buy credits um you buy credits and then if you request any kind of uh, edit or new feature to your platform we can just tell you how many credits that will be and then it just comes off your balance it's almost this prepaid balance and then you get to kind of judge um you kind of work out a feeling of how many credits equate to a piece of work so the reason we kind of went down that is for some of the changes you can make with no code are very very easy to the point where you can't really go to this, this time in materials gets a little bit tricky when the client knows you are literally just dragging and dropping an arrow to a new box and then pressing save but we all know there's no such thing as a five minute job um by the time you've actually spoke to someone you know worked it out it's always that kind of hour so we thought then is would this be a more appropriate way of working with no code i don't have the answer yet we haven't launched it um so that's kind of like a work in progress but from a back office point of view, that is a full my account. It takes payments. It manages credits. It has historic tickets. It's almost like a client portal that was made out of no code. And that was also built on a dollar as well. And if anyone wants to have a look at that, you know, I'm more than happy to share logins. Um, just, you know, drop me an email or drop Adam an email. And in fact, if anyone wants to look anything I can share with you, I'm more than happy to share logins. You can have a little poke around the admin panel and what have you as well. So this is where we've come a little bit unstuck with no code. GDPR. So predominantly a lot of the no code platforms are in the US and they only store data in the US unless they are quite mature. And then you have the ability or if you move on to an enterprise package, you will have the ability to select which data center. There are a number of organizations. I, would, I don't know if I would, I would say... In my experience, predominantly nonprofit and charity that have IT policies where they expect data to be stored in this country, depending on the data they are actually using this no code platform for. We have multiple times got to verbal acceptance for certain projects only to be stopped at IT uh, or the due diligence or the GDPR team that's stating they're just not happy with this. Uh, and they would like something, they would actually like something custom, which they, they can host in their own infrastructure and they don't have to change their policy. Who owns the IP? So this one's quite interesting because it depends on how like granular you get with IP, which could just be like, you, you know, your colors, your branding. You don't own the code. 
you basically just pay the license to access store and operate it right so I didn't really know how to answer that one in fact I basically gave the answer that you have there you're, you're using another platform's code to build your product I don't know how you would protect your IP there because there's no reason why someone can't just go onto the same platform and recreate your product I, I, I actually don't know where you stand and then another one we had which I thought was interesting is I've never been asked this before when we sent the contract across, they wanted to know how they would be sure that we hadn't taken someone else's work and claimed it as our own to pass across to them. Well, that was a little bit of a gray area as well, because technically we're using someone else's work, <laughs> building on top of it to pass across to them. So we kind of had a conversation with them. And the way we actually settled at the end is every time we delivered on a sprint, we just had to put a caveat in the email saying all this work has been created on land's time. To the best of our knowledge, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't impact anyone else's work. And they seem quite happy with that. That was a US company, incidentally. So I wonder if there's, you know, I wonder if there's you know been cases over there of that. Um data access as well. So some clients, particularly some of the larger ones, and go, you know, nonprofit and charities, they like to carry out a full due diligence of any software that's introduced into the business. That introduces risks and it also introduces additional costs and workload on whoever's actually looking at that. Uh, another example, uh, we were going to build an event app uh, for four big events using no code, where it was just effectively a data capture that they would then go into a CSV uh, that then get uploaded to the CRM. They had an existing native app that was really, really clunky and didn't really work to the point where no one really used it and they were just collecting data in ways that they felt they were more efficient. The cost of upgrading that app, uh, so actually no, the cost of the no-code platform was approximately 60 to 70% less than the upgrade of the native app that they had to go through every year. However, that cost disappeared as soon as, it, as, soon as this new software platform had to go through due, uh, due diligence, GDPR, and like any kind of uh, data analysis. So in the end, they, so it's not always just the project costs. So in the end, they actually stayed with the incumbent because there was less risk and there was less workload. And because time was also against them in terms of, you know, the events were only like three or four months away, um, that project never even crossed the line. Um, <clears throat> so we are talking about um, stability earlier and particularly when we're choosing what no code platform to use so one thing as well so vc funding is this double-edged sword so if they get vc funding you know they've got a couple of quid in the bank but you also know that they are now on some very ambitious user acquisition targets in order to meet the needs of their vcs and what they promised them in order to get that funding what that can mean is there can be an element of get everyone in through the door and then we'll work out the problems later and an example of that is probably speed for native apps for Adalo. And I think I can share that because if you go on any of the forums, <laughs> yeah, we're not the only one that's suffering from that. So effectively, it's get the customers in and then we'll work out the scaling problems afterwards. You know, that's not uncommon for, you know, any life cycle, the life cycle of any business. But I think if you are relying on that platform to either launch your own business or to sell services to other clients, you know, that's that, that potentially is going to cause some awkward conversations. Uh, right, and my last slide. So I think the no code for us, huge potential and lots of opportunity. It allows us to fail fast and learn very, very quickly. <clears throat> and I think my only caution or no caution is not all platforms are going to make it. Um, there are mature ones out there and there are ones getting launched every week. Uh, and I think just be aware of that fact. Um, just be aware of that fact. And then just, you know, just if you're not sure, just watch the landscape carefully and you know see what happens from them. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Stop sharing now. Cool. Does anyone have any questions for John? Any questions? Ah, uh, yeah. I've just seen that partnership with Nano. I get. I've had some emails. I'm just answering Ben's. Yeah, Zano. Yeah. What? So, you know, and all this is based on, you know, what we experienced, you know, last week, this week, and we all know how quickly these things can, you know, how quickly these things can change. So, you know, don't take what I've said as gospel for the next four or five months. I don't think that would be fair. I think, uh, I think Bubble got a bad rap for a very long time about speed, particularly for some of their bigger 
bigger apps and I know that it was like the main thing you know we had uh, Josh come and do a talk for us who talks with the developers quite a bit I think and he was saying that it was like their number one thing that they were piling everyone onto to make sure that, that things run faster so I think I think they're building the software as as they want you to build stuff with the software right as, as quickly as they can and, and reactively based on the uh, based on user requirements but uh um oh, I thought we had did uh go on Ben yeah cheers John no, that was great um bit of a random one do you have a favorite <laughs> The one that you like to use, like, a lot? It was a Dallow until I launched Peaky Baggers about six weeks ago. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so there's a couple... In terms of favourite, probably Zapier, just because I've worked with it for so long now, and it, it has saved me a few times. Um, the two that I haven't had a chance to play with yet that I'm quite interested in is Retool. And uh, another one I got an email for the other day, which uh, one of my colleagues is looking at is Tooljet. And Tooljet's an example of one that you can actually host locally. Uh, Vlad, uh, I get emails from Product Hunt uh, and then just some of the social networks that we're following. And then you tend to find, right, if something's really, really good, you find out about it really quickly. And, you know, the, opposite, the opposite's true as well, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Have you, um, have you had any experience with Flutterflow? I haven't, no. I've heard about it, though, and I think we tested it out for the WordPress native app. I think we were playing around with that, but it, that just wasn't suitable for that either. Okay. Too many toys, right? I know, right, yeah. Is it Stefan, Stephen? Sorry, Stefan? Yeah, um, well, thanks for this session. I got one question re related to the e-commerce uh, uh, landscape. Can you tell something about that regarding uh, your no-code experience? Obviously, there's Shopify, but I'm more coming from a industry where more of like enterprise uh, software, like uh, uh, demandware, Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Um, so, what's what's your experience in terms of uh, uh, e-commerce in in um, for using uh, no-code uh, platforms? Uh, with e-commerce, it's quite limited, and it's definitely not at enterprise level. I think the interesting thing. Um, that we're currently working on actually at the minute, but it's still in progress, is using Airtable for your um, back office. So using Sh so Shopify is great. And if you move on to Shopify Plus, you know, there's a lot more, there's a few more options there, but that also that's the $2,000 a month starting. So we're currently working on this kind of stock order management system. So Shopify is going to plug directly into Airtable and Airtable is going to be effectively the interface. That gives us, you know, huge possibilities because it's effectively a database with a UI on top, which means we can customize that. And I'm seeing that. Uh, in fact, I, that's not our idea, by the way. I've copied that off someone else and I have no, I can't remember who it was. But I read about that about three or four months ago. So we started playing around with it. And I think there's actually templates out there. From an enterprise point of view, I'm not sure. Um, oh, no, that's, that's perfectly fine. It's just that, that I don't have really an experience outside of the enterprise stuff. So that's why I'm just curious into, well, no code platforms uh, on, on well, a level below that, especially uh, integrating it with different tools like uh, Airtable, you're saying. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Um, Airtable is one I think we're going to be doing a lot more with in the future, and we've got some projects coming up. Um, softer, actually, going back to um, uh, Ben's question. So I played with Softer a little bit. Uh, that integrates love, uh, really, really well with Airtable. It wasn't quite what we needed for this particular project, but I'm getting, a, you know, the last six to eight weeks, there's been a load of updates. I just haven't had a chance to look at. But software is, a, that looks like a pretty, little bit more defined than maybe a Dallow in terms of, it's like widgets rather than having to build everything yourself. But that's definitely worth a look. Cool. Thanks. So, no worries. Software, software has payments built in as well, doesn't it? So you can accept payments for the stuff with Stripe and what have you Ooh, at any point in there. Um, so, stacker for UE on top of yeah, stacker's awesome. I love stacker. Quite right, expensive, that. but it's it's very very good it, for internal tools. It's very 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 good, but it's very very limited in terms of at the moment in terms of um, like front end. Let's say um, it's it's pretty much change a few colors here and there. The layouts are pretty much out right, of okay. um, but you can build really complex tools in minutes, literally. So um, yeah, it's very very good. Nice. Alex. Yeah, hello. Um, I was wondering um, 
do you find that most of the, the things you end up building with no code are internal tools or are they kind of you know standalone apps and websites you know like more externally focused <sighs> internal probably right okay um, well, well, actually no that's not fair <laughs> if you start taking in things like webflow um if you start taking things like webflow and things like that then it's probably external but if he's talking about i guess more application based for us it's been more internal so far right okay so more like that flow diagram you had where you'd kind of replace all those fields and everything yeah uh or probably more so like the the my account panel that we have for no code where you can effectively buy you buy credits right estimate of a credit and then accept it so almost like a client management platform mm -hmm. and are you, are you coming across a lot of kind of businesses that are operating on no code code fully or just does it tend to be just partially for special projects or um smaller businesses fully mm -hmm. i think where the real superpowers come in is uh, if you can do 90% no code and then you have someone that's familiar with some JavaScript or a bit of API development and do the 10% custom, and that's where you can supercharge that no code. You really are customizing it for yourself because I, I guess any SaaS platform, which is technically what no codes are, I kind of expect 80, 85% of my requirements to be met and then sacrificing the 10, 15. Whereas if you can combine the both, and we've done that a couple of times, and that's with the, that's with the pet PWA actually, um, that just took it to a whole new level. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. No worries. I think Alex, in terms of the <clears throat> uh, what I'd heard recently, that there's quite a few of the platforms which I won't name, but the main app development platforms that are starting to push more to focus their marketing towards internal tools, mm -hmm. primarily because the app development side of things is product-based, effectively tech startups, mm -hmm. and the the level of failure there is much higher than if you were looking at internal tools for businesses that they're going to use because so so it's that concept that that if they get the more internal tools then actually you've it's a general rule right but you, you're more like those customers are more likely to still be there in you know three five years time rather than kind of trying something out and then disappearing after six months whether it's because of mvp or or just because the the, the product failed or or something completely different but yeah uh, apparently that's the that's the uh, the current uh, sort of focus is on is on internal tools yeah and also the amount of businesses are, that are built on spreadsheets mm -hmm. which are you know they doesn't scale it's you know it's open to error it doesn't really it's, it's not really well structured data for any kind of visualization so those businesses they kind of have this mvp through that spreadsheet that actually no code tools can take that and just drive so many efficiencies that becomes a no-brainer for them because there's a clear return on investment. Yeah. So we've actually, over the last year, replaced our off-the-shelf CRM ATS with a complete Airtable Webflow nice. build, like the whole business. And now I'm looking at it thinking, and why I turned up today was like, would other businesses want this in my sector? Um, but I'm not sure I want to kind of go down the path of, you know, having clients and servicing them on a no-code front. You've kind of put me off today, so that's all right. <laughs> Oh, my work's done. I'm eliminating the competitors every <laughs> night for this talk. <clears throat> so what, what sector are you in? Uh, recruitment. Ah, so yeah. I don't know much about that recruitment, but I have spoke to a couple of people over the years and the existing recruitment software out there, particularly the um, existing CRMs, they're expensive, very expensive. Yeah, they're expensive and, and quite limited. And all the kind of contract terms are quite punitive. So they'll like charge you for downloading your own data out of the system. They're like, you know, minimum two year contracts, 90 pound per license. So you've got, you know, a real high cost per head. Yeah. Uh, kind of um, uh, the, the expectation from the sector is is very low in terms of what they should get from their tech. So they don't look outside the, the main players. Um, but the efficiencies like we've found using no code are unbelievable. Um, so have you managed to use no code to post um, job adverts to various different job sites or do you not? You don't go down that route? haven't gone down that route yet so we've built our own job board essentially Ooh. so we've aggregated and then reposted and then we put our jobs at the top so we haven't then um uh, distributed those jobs or tried to but I, I think it it wouldn't be that difficult um to go to the main boards and find a service to do that well, I wonder if you could do it with yeah uh, Zapier you know or those those kind of 
those kind of tools because they have a lot of custom coding steps now or was it integra i don't think it's called that anymore i think it's called make make yeah yeah, that's yeah. It. we use we use um, make to push out to buffer and then schedule all on social nice um, but i think i think with the job boards you just got to produce your own xml feed right okay um, so you can do that zap you yeah yeah and then push it out and then as long as you've got enough traffic they'll take your feed and repost it so if you were going to package it to other recruitment companies what i would do is have it very defined as a package mm. very defined and it's like it's this and then everything else is custom <laughs> and then treat it as you know any kind of custom and to be honest though you know if they've got any kind of technical skills in-house you've done the hard work by like constructing everything and putting it all together you know it's easy to change a field name or break it <laughs> Yeah, I spoke at a little conference last week and they were kind of like, oh, we would need someone really techie to look at this. Or, but, that, you know, with no code, like I'm self-taught and, and you know, I think there's so many so much resource out there. You just need someone with an interest, really. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the thought of migrating data, you know, my own data is terrible. Never mind doing it for clients. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I don't want to be responsible, you know, for, for losing data and things. So have you seen like cost reduce on a monthly basis as well now then now you're using yeah. your own software yeah yeah apart from i keep buying all these new tools and then doing stuff with them so like but i think if you're doing it um you know like no frills then yeah 20 dollar air table compared to you know a 90 90 pound license on on one of the office shelves and and they will charge you for every bolt on and they're not yeah, using yeah. The past tools so i sync with like a cold email tool and you know, passing tool and everything, but they'll charge you for all the extras. Um, yeah, we've got a HR platform a bit like that. As soon as you want anything else, it's an extra five dollars a user. Yeah, and I guess the thing, the best thing is you just build what you need. Yeah, right. You don't have all this bloated future set because the CRM I was on, they were like developing a, you know, an app for your Apple Watch, and I'm like, why well, don't want my CRM on my Apple Watch? But always be closed. Be funded, right? So they're yeah. like, <laughs> I have to build all these futures. Like, no one's using that. <laughs> That's but that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for asking the question. Anyway. Yeah. No worries. We've got a hand up with uh, Felipe, but he just turned his camera off, so I'm not sure if we lost him. Uh, um, yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? How you doing? Yeah. Uh, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Felipe Gutierrez. I am. Um, visiting a friend for some time in Ferry Hill. I think you all live near Newcastle. Is it that the case? Yeah. So if somebody is still near Ferry Hill or Durham, it would be great to, to meet the real people who are interested in uh, no code because I don't know any real person still. Um, I am in uh, We Are No Code. Maybe you know Christian Pedrelli? I don't, Adam. Ne never here? No, I don't know, no. So it's, uh, I will put it in the, in the chat. I am uh, there since uh, one year, more or less. We are no code .com. I've heard of the website, I did, yeah, but I didn't know the person. Ah, okay. So you you know the the website. Okay, okay. Then you you know you know them. Okay. And uh, we have a meeting every Friday since like uh, one year. <clears throat> and um, uh, yeah, I I would like to to really meet some uh, real person, <laughs> like because uh, I I met a lot, but only virtually. And I didn't, I, I by chance uh, found the, the meetup uh, group. And uh, of course, I was very, very happy. I just, uh, I was uh, working quite a lot with uh, Bubble.io. Uh, and then uh, since uh, we are no code, I changed to software. Maybe you know software EO. And uh, Airtable, I think Airtable you also use. It, uh, I think it's uh, great. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's me. Uh, I try to learn um, um, code, but uh, and I am uh, since 2016 trying to create 
an app for a small town. And um, uh, well, that's all. <laughs> I'm from Spain. I'm a translator. German Spanish is my main uh, business. And a diving instructor. And uh, hello to everybody. Thanks, Felipe. We have talked. We have talked about doing. Um, um, well, we did do one. Me and Ben, wasn't it? And it. Uh, um, I don't know what it's called now. What's the place called that we did there in person? Oh, come on, brain. Tusk Park. Tusk Park. Thank you very much, William. I got there just before you actually, so I did remember. But um, we did do one one in person. It was in in uh, yeah in um, collaboration with Tech Startup Sunderland. Um, I think we we'll look at it again, but I'm thinking more to do rather than look at doing a monthly event in person. We'll probably keep the normal the monthly events online for now and do like a, a social event at some point and just get everyone together as a kind of one off a, a no code social something like that. Um, and do it that way and see. I want to. I want to I wanna, yeah, be sure that that yeah, that that if we're doing it in person, that we can get a nice uh, a nice crowd together. So hopefully we'll do a no code social fairly soon. I was going to, going to do one at Christmas, but then uh, Christmas happened. <laughs> um, so yeah, but we'll definitely look to do something in person soon. So if you're on the meetup group and the, and the, if you sign up on the website to the to the Mailchimp uh, the mail list, um, then we'll keep you updated on that. And we'll obviously be meeting in person for the conference in June, so that's three months away. So hopefully do a meet up before then. Cool. Did anyone else have a question? No. Thanks very much, John. That was brilliant. Um, I think we've got some really good good stuff out there. And again, it's I think it's quite nice we're doing a bit of zooming out, uh, you know, looking at different tools and different uh, situations and, and, and examples. And then zooming in a little bit. Um, I'm hoping next month, um, but it's to be confirmed in the next few days uh, that we'll have um, uh, someone from Stacker come in to talk about uh, uh, Stacker, um, as you'd expect. Uh, although it's not, it, it'll be it'll be Stacker in context, let's say. So the talk itself, and uh, I think Ollie's quite keen not to do something specifically just on the tool, but uh, um, to talk about maybe internal and business apps with no code. So. That should be exciting. If it doesn't happen next month, I'm hoping it will happen in the next couple uh, and we've got a backup that we'll, we'll turn to then. But uh, yeah, uh, keep in touch on the website. Um, sign up on the uh, uh, to follow us on Twitter and we'll keep everyone up to date that way. Otherwise, have a lovely Tuesday evening and um, we'll see you, see you all next month. That's your Thank later. you very much. Yeah, Thanks, yeah, John. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs>